just, um, you know, tonight's a, tonight's a special night. Uh, I don't know if you saw that the moon and Mars are, and Earth are all aligning tonight, you know, and it's probably going to do something wacky. No, it's not good. But it happens very rare. In fact, that it's called this night, it, uh, the moon is supposed to be a blue moon tonight. And they say, you know, with Mars and the Earth and aligning and stuff, it's a very rare thing. It, it doesn't happen often. In fact, it only happens once in a blue moon. <laughs> now you know. <laughs> that's, that's all true, too. That's the sad part is everything I told you is true. It's happening tonight. So Mars, you can be able to see it, I guess. It's going to be brightest it's been in two years or something like that. So I don't know. I didn't get I was looking for the... I was looking for the time, and, and honestly, whenever I look for the time on those, I'm really disappointed because it's like yuck o'clock in the morning, and it's like, I, yeah, I don't want to do that. So, uh, But it's happening sometime. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me. Yeah, everybody's getting on the phone to look at what time, and you'll just tell me something, right? Okay. Oh, let me know, Joe May, once you find it. <laughs> it. It is after dark. How are we doing, Doug? How are you guys doing? Newly, the newlyweds are here. It's great. Yeah, it's great to have you here. Um, I got to get moving here. It's, oh, wow. Okay, I got to get moving, so listen very quickly. I'm going to tell you a quick story. Um, some years ago, over, over 35 years ago or so, mom and dad are in Florida. They go to the small community in, in Sarasota that we go to called Pinecraft. It's a very Mennonite, very Amish community. And they went to a restaurant to to have lunch and you know in a lot of these small communities there's uh, a table for the locals except for the locals there really aren't local they're just snowbirds you know that make up the local table and they think they own the place but um so anyway they're all they're talking they're always trying to ever been to a place or with people who are always trying to figure out who everybody is <laughs> got that laugh <laughs> so you know they want to know i haven't seen that person before they must be and they did that to my dad, and my mom overheard him. And one person said, well, he must be the evangelist coming into town. You know, he, he evidently he had his Hawaiian shirt on that looked like an evangelist-type shirt or something. And so uh, and we got kind of a joke out of that, thinking that dad's a celebrity of some sort, an evangelist coming into town, going to be at the local church. Um, and, I, and the reason I say that is because that's how people are. We want to know something about celebrities, those people that are hard to get to. That's why we have TV shows like TMZ, like we have um, Access Hollywood, we have The Insider, we have Entertainment Tonight. The list goes on because we're curious. We want to want, we wonder about people we've heard about, but we really can't reach out to, really can't get there. We just have our own ideas about them, and we want to know what they're really like. And we do the same thing with God. We want to know, is God really who he says he is and other people says he is? Is he really great? Is he really good? Does he really care about me? Is God, if he's big enough to really run this world, is he really, really good enough to care about me? I mean, I'm just a speck on his radar. After all, you know, I, I started my life as a young child learning prayers from mom and dad. Now lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord to slam a break. You know, <laughs> maybe you didn't say it that way. That's the one my dad taught us, and my mom taught us a different version of it. Um, <laughs> uh, no, but for meals, we would pray, What you know the prayer, God is great, God is good. And so from a little, now we thank him for it. From a little child on, I'm learning God is great, and God is good. And the question as an adult, a lot of times we ask are, is that really true? As in when we look around and you watch TV, you read the newspaper or, or get on the MSN homepage and see all the stuff spinning through what's going on, you really wonder about the question of the greatness of God and the goodness of God when there's a lot of junk going on in the world today. And that bothers a lot of people. There's a lot of evil in the world. There's a lot of sad things happening. You heard Bruce talk about the family that had, um, they, they lost a child through, through heroin overdose, and then they have a flood, and they lose their house. And, you know, it's easy to wonder. And when evil things and bad things happen, that's a point where people tend to doubt God. They, and maybe you've even asked the question, but a lot of people have asked the question, if God is great and God really is good, why is there suffering in the world? 
Why is there so much pain in the world? So that means that God is either all powerful and not good or he's good and not all that powerful. That's how a lot of people reason it. And maybe you have, too, when you've come to a time of difficulty in your life. According to the Bible, though, God is all powerful. According to the Bible, God is great. In fact, like the song we sang last week, Behold Our God, Isaiah says, says this. Oh, you've got to turn it on, I guess. Come on. Can you flip that screen for me, please? Isaiah says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens by the span and calculated the dust of the earth by the measure and weighed the mountains in a balance and the hills in a pair of scales? Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has informed him? Can you go to the next slide, please? With whom did he consult? And who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him of the way of understanding? Now, understand that these questions that Isaiah is, is poking at us is, are rhetorical questions, and the implied answer to all these questions are no one. No one has told God that. God alone is great. He is the creator of all the good that there is. That's why the psalmist wrote, I lift my eyes to the hills. For where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of creator, maker of heaven and earth. Now, when I was looking on that, I, um, there we go, back up here. This thing is just going crazy. When I was looking on that, that up, I never thought about looking that scripture up because it was always a comforting scripture for me. But I, I thought, I lift my eyes to the hills. Why would the psalmist write this? And he writes it simply because that's where the pagan altars would be, up on the hills and the high places. Asherah, Baal, and all those altars would be in the high places. So he's saying, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? It doesn't come from the pagan altars. It doesn't come from all those places. It comes from the one who makes the heavens and the earth. It comes from the almighty God. And he finds that it's my comfort, my strength, everything comes from him. And it makes sense that to believe that if, if there is a God who created everything, he's got to be great, doesn't he? If he creates the earth, it's got to take a great God to do those things. But we know that, we know he cares for us, but in the pagan world, their gods didn't. Their gods just used humans as little toys, as little playthings. Their god didn't care for them at all. I mean, you can read the stories of mystic, the mythic stories of Zeus and Apollos and all those people. They didn't care about human beings at all. Just playthings. The Bible, as we read the Bible, we see how the good God is. And we like to believe he's good. The thing is, all the suffering in the world is what really trips me up sometimes. Maybe you. God, what's going on? What is going on? Are the words of Jesus true? My God, my God, why have you forsaken us? It's as if the presence of pain proves the absence of God's goodness. For example, when Kayla was 18 months old, um, I had, it was winter time. I had made myself a cup of hot chocolate using milk, and I, I knew she was just getting into things, walking, and I, I set it in a place where I didn't think she could get to it, and I went down to the basement to do some work. All of a sudden, I hear a sc some screaming and stuff, and I go running up, and there's Kathy holding Kayla. Kathy has this fearful look in her eye, eyes, and Kayla is screaming. She had, while I put the cup away from her, I, we had a little cloth doily thing, whatever that lamp was sitting on, and she reached for that and pulled the cup toward her, spilled the hot chocolate on her hand, and being with milk, it really stuck there, and it was just freshly brewed hot, and it was just a terrible thing. So we got the neighbors to come watch, Jessica and Andrea, Kathy and I rushed Kayla to the hospital, the emergency room. We're waiting for a doctor. The, a nurse happens to be a high school classmate, I think, of Kathy's, and, and we're 
you know, can we do something? And doctor hadn't given orders yet, so we couldn't do anything. And Kayla is screaming and screaming in pain. And Kathy's holding her. And I, I am feeling absolutely helpless. If I could have taken that pain in a moment, I would have done that. But I couldn't. And that is the trouble. I couldn't take her pain away as an 18-month-old. I wanted to so bad, but I couldn't do that. Finally, I, I, I talked to the nurse, and I said, listen, can't we give her something? And she finally goes and talks to the doctor. She comes back with some Tylenol, a cup with Tylenol and codeine. And Kayla's, Wah! you know, she's screaming and writhing in pain, and it's just a terrible just noise. And, and I'm looking, and I'm saying, that is not going to work. She is not going to drink that. I told her, I said, go put that in a syringe and come back. She looks at me, and she goes and puts it in a syringe. She comes back, and I, I take Kayla, I hold Kayla, and I force her mouth open and still because she's just screaming, a little 18-month. I force her, I hold her against her will, which seems to make it worse from her perspective, hold her mouth open, and they sh I told the nurse, shoot the medicine down her throat i had dogs i know how to do this and you th you think that's crazy but it forces her to swallow the medicine and get it down a few minutes later it just knocked her out and settled her down now you might think as a father holding her tight like that and making her mouth stay open and forcing her against her role was a terrible thing but sometimes in life especially i think with doctors a doctor has to lead a patient through pain in order to bring them to health. Kathy, you had some knee surgery done. You went through a lot of pain before you could come to health. We know what that's like. If you've had any kind of work done, sometimes you have to go through pain in order to come to health. Pain itself that Kayla had did not disprove my love for her. I did something. I held her in a way that I didn't want to have to do it. Pain itself does not disprove God's love and care for us. A and, and it doesn't disprove his existence in the world. The simple fact is, even if you choose to deny God because of the suffering in our world, you're still going to have suffering in the world. You can tell me all you want that God doesn't exist because look at all the pain and suffering. You're still going to have suffering in the world. The thing is, you're going to still have to go through that pain and suffering. And you're going to have to do it without God. He's a gentleman. He won't come to you unless you ask for him. You'll have to deal with it on your own. Would you rather deal with the terrible times that come in life on your own? Or would you rather deal with them with God? Me and my house, we want God on our side. And some people choose to do that. Deists, for example. Deists, they try to have it both ways. Deists believe that, that God is, was involved in creation and, and God has created everything and he put a spin on this world and he got her going and he said, okay, you're on your own. What will be, will be. That's what they believe. But that's not the God of the Bible. That's not what I read. God is involved. God is a personal God who is good. God, God is the one who walked with people in the cool of the day, didn't he? The Bible says that. God is the one who wants a relationship with, uh, with us. And isn't that the problem, a relationship? How I many know relationships are problems? Why? Because it involves people. It involves trust. It involves getting hurt. It involves all sorts of stuff. Relationships are good. We need them, but they can be messy and they can have problems. They're risky, aren't they? C.S. Lewis, uh, in, in Mere Christianity, wrote this. If a thing is, to be, is free to be good, it is also free to be bad. And free will is what has made evil possible. Why then did God give them free will? Because free will, though it makes evil possible, is also the only thing that makes possible any love or goodness or joy worth having. A world of automata, of creatures that work like machines, would hardly be worth creating. A world made of puppets, marionettes, and God as a grand puppeteer making us do it all would not be a world worth creating at all. 
On the other side is the world that God did create, a people with free will and choice to choose to love him and receive his love in the process. It, this means that for a relational God to exist, there has to be freedom to choose to be part of that relationship. It's one of the ways that God is good, by giving us freedom. And the very same person who doesn't want God to exist, says God doesn't exist because this, or to interfere in their everyday life, is the one person who in the moment of suffering want God to have interfered, to take them out of suffering. People say, I don't want God, I don't need God, I'll do this. But when suffering happens, what do they say? Where's God now? Wait a minute, you can't have it both ways. You either want him or you don't. And that's the problem with people. You can't have freedom to choose and only be able to choose good. For God to set up the world in a way for relationship where people can choose to be involved in his goodness or not, he, can, he also could not set up where we could only choose good. Are you tracking with me on this? And that's the problem. People choose their way instead of God's way. Have you? And because people choose their way, evil and suffering exist in the world. It exists whether you believe in God or not. It's just how it is. And because the Bible tells us about a God that does exist, we find that we're not left to deal with this on our own. The good news is that there is a great God who's a good God who decided to put on skin and come into the world and enter into our suffering. It's in Jesus that we see the greatness and the goodness of God. We're going over time here. And just hang in there. I have a video clip I would like to show you. And so um, just to take a pause and think about, it's a song, think about what he's singing. Hear the prayers of those of us who live on earth Who are afraid of being left by those we love And who get hardened in the earth Do you remember when you lived down here But we all scream To find the faith to ask for daily bread did you forget about us? Do you have thrown away? Well, I memorized every word you said. Still, I'm so scared I'm holding my breath. While you're up there just playing hard to get.
even if it could be explained And I know that I'm only lashing out At the one who loves me And after I have figured this somehow What I really need to know Is if you live in eternity Hear the prayers of those of us who live in time We can't see what's ahead And we cannot get free from what we've left behind I'm reeling from these voices that keep screaming in my ear All these words of shame and doubt, blame and regret I can't see how you're leading me Unless you've led me To where I'm lost enough to let myself be led so you've been here all along, I guess It's just your ways and you are just plain hard to get Rich Mullins, um, he wrote Step by Step, Our God's an Awesome God, songs like that, and um, he lived a tough, dark life, and this song is a song he was writing it as he heard it, just been on the cassette player, and he was, those are words from the heart, and words like playing hard to get versus you're just playing hard to get. And I like that line where I'm lost enough to let myself be led. Um, Jesus understood our suffering. He understood our pain. Jesus was born in major. He was moved, born in poverty. He was an, he uh, immigrated to Egypt, worked as a carpenter. He was had no place to lay his head. He was rumored about. He falsely accused, beaten, and hung on a cross. He understood pain and suffering. The writer of Hebrews described Jesus this way. He said, while Jesus was here on the earth, he offered prayers and pleadings with a loud cry and tears to the one who could rescue him from death. And God heard his prayers because of his deep reverence for God. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. Did you get that? Suffering is part of our life, even for the Son of God. But he also knew that God was great. Didn't he? He taught the disciples and us how to pray, Our Father who is in heaven. And he knew that God was good. Hallowed be your name. Holy is your name. Awesome is your name. God is above all in greatness and goodness. And because he cares for us, he, he said that God wants to work with us. He said, your kingdom come, your will be done, where on earth, just how, just like it is in heaven. And he wants you and me to work hand in hand, side by side with the Father God. Not work for him, not him work for us, but side by side with him. And during the rest of the prayer, Jesus taught the disciples he told him that God is involved in your everyday life. Daily, he used words like daily bread, forgiveness, temptation, deliverance from evil, deliverance from the evil one. He understood that there was another force in our world, and we better listen to Jesus on this one. That suffering and evil are part of our world because there's an enemy who wants you to doubt God. From the beginning of creation to right now. And part of the enemy's strategy to destroy you is to have bad things happen to you, to those near you, to those around you, so that you will 
doubt God. He uses suffering to make you doubt God. He makes you think that God's not great, that God's not good. The enemy does those things. Pretty effective, isn't it? In the midst of suffering, in the midst of pain, we doubt. And let me just tell you, so often... When people get into suffering and pain, they turn to the Bible, they try to get it straight, they try to get stronger in the Lord. Let me tell you, that's it's too late. You get stronger in the Lord before you're suffering and pain. Because it's what you've just done that helps you through the suffering and pain. Let me, if you're trying to do it while you're in the midst of the valley, I'm sorry. It's really tough because that valley, all the stuff that's coming at you, just just surrounds you and and just overcomes you so often. Here's an example. Jesus is a great model in life. Jesus, before he started his ministry, what happened to him? He takes 40 days in the wilderness, doesn't he? No food, no water. What's he doing with those 40 days? What's he doing? He's with the Father, isn't he? Spending time with the Father. And a lot of people will say that that's when the devil came after 40 days and tempted Jesus, the temptations. They say, what a great plan. What a great strategy. Let me just tell you this. That was a dumb plan. That was a bad strategy on the devil's part because Jesus had just got done spending 40 days with the Father. Sure, physically he's weak. Spiritually, he is strong. 40 days with the Father, and the devil thinks because he's physically weak, I can get him now. Uh Uh-uh. No way. No way. Without a doubt, Jesus believed that God was great and God was good and that he would care for his needs. And he had no interest in what Satan had to offer him. His perspective was a perspective of heaven, not on earth. And again, the writer of Hebrews encourages that early church that's being persecuted, the early church that's going through tough times with these words. You know these words. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. Why? Because he's the author and perfecter of our faith. Who for the, ah, this part really gets me. Who for the joy set before him, enduring the cross. The joy set before him, enduring the cross, scorning its shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The joy, he was looking way beyond the suffering. He was looking way beyond this present reality that we have. Jesus endured suffering because he had a vision of something better that awaited him there. And do you have that vision? I'm telling you what, in the middle of suffering and pain, we need a vision, a heavenly vision of our home. The suffering we experience here on earth isn't part of God's original plan of creation. But Jesus reminds us that God is working all things out. And as the song says a few weeks ago, we sang, he's making all things new. I want to encourage you. Have the vision of Jesus. Have the mind of Jesus. Believe like Jesus did. Believe that God is involved and does care about your life. Even when he doesn't seem like he's near. Because he is near. Believe that God is both great and good. Father God,